time to start. So uh, thank you very much for your atten uh, attending this space webinar again. So, so in fact, this is the last seminar of this year. So as you know that given the difficulty of the trouble during this COVID pan pandemic, this has been organized by Computation Imaging TC. And this has been uh, quite successful. We have uh, quite a lot of positive responses from the audience in general. So because of that, actually our organizing committee decided to continue Series 2, Space Webinar Series 2 next year after brief pause. So the, for detail, our side will talk about, uh, we'll actually announce it later at the end of this seminar. So uh, as a uh, last uh, webinar of this year, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker today. Uh, today's speaker is a Professor Webb Steinman from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Wabi is actually uh, got a PhD from University of Michigan in electric engineering, and his research main interest is mainly focused on the medical imaging system modeling, design, and optimization, including X-ray CT and cone beam and phase contrast CT. And also, he's uh, actually working in interventional imaging, as well as the signal processing, estimation theory, and etc. So. Today he is actually talking. Uh, he is going to talk about the exciting development of X-ray and computer tomography. And without further ado, uh, further ado, I I like to give uh, mic to Rap. So, yeah. hey, thank you, Jong. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I'm honored to be uh, amongst uh, the colleagues. Thank you, uh, Jong and Sai, for inviting me. Uh, so uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and hopefully folks can see that. Um, joining me today is uh, Dr. Grace Gong. She's been instrumental in doing a lot of the work that I'm going to show today. Uh, while I'll be giving the presentation, she'll be available for some of the questions and answers. Uh, so uh, the, the talk I'm going to give today is about novel data acquisition and task-based optimization in computer tomography. And this is really a, it's a summary of a number of different projects we have going on at Johns Hopkins here. Uh, let's see. Change to presentation mode. Is a, uh, I'm it's sorry. Not in the first screen. Yeah, it's not in the first screen. So it's this not, way, I think it's the, Oh, are you seeing? Uh, yeah, note and those things. Hold on a second. Let me let me retry this. Mm -hmm. There we go. Great. Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, let me uh, let me just jump into things. Uh, so I wanted to. Okay. Going to advance. There we go. I wanted to start off. Uh, so I suspect many of you are familiar with uh, CT, but just in case you aren't, here's a CT scanner uh, with the door open. The critical elements of the scanner are you have an x ray tube that emits x rays, patient goes somewhere in the middle, and there is a curved detector on the opposite side. Basically, what you're obtaining is projection data through the patient based on what x-rays survive the transit. And if you, that's not enough to give you a three-dimensional image, but if you spin around the patient and collect enough data, then you can uh, do the mathematical inversion to create the 3D volume of attenuation coefficient. This is one of my favorite uh, videos. I always show students in the lab. Uh, a lot of folks, you, you don't often see these running with the covers off, but it's really an amazing piece of uh, engineering. It's also an incredibly difficult environment to design new hardware for because things are spinning so quickly. On the flip side, when you have this ton of material rotating at three to five hertz, you can actually collect data very, very quickly. Um, so this is the environment we've been working in. Um, CT scanners have basically worked in this fashion for the past several de decades, but
but what I'd like to show you is some of the novel things that we've been working on. There are other groups working on similar ideas. I think it's also helpful to have a little bit of mathematical notation so that we're speaking a similar language. Um, this is an illustration where I'm really looking at a 2D to 2D, 2D problem, but it's analogous to 3D. Uh, the, data, the, the thing I'm actually interested in is that distribution of attenuation values that we generally call mu when we're doing the CP. Um, so that is telling you the relative amount of X-ray stopping power of different materials. So denser objects tend to have a higher attenuation coefficient. When we collect data on this kind of object, you, you would get a single projection and it is a, essentially a sum, so a linear operation, but we get that overall angle. So you can see an enumeration of angles in the vertical direction, enumeration of radii in the other direction. We get this uh, projection data that we generally refer to as a sinogram. So that's a, a linear operation that you can describe as a system matrix times the, the values you're interested in. Now in transmission tomography, the photons obey Beer's law as they pass through the object. And there's an exponential survival probability, a negative exponential, that is described here. So if you put in a certain number of photons I naught, you would expect uh, the output number of photons you're getting to obey that survival probability. So when you're trying to do the mathematical inversion, you can make a number of decisions of how you do this inversion process. Maybe one straightforward way is to divide out the I naught, take a log, and then solve this linear problem, or you might want to go after it directly and solve the nonlinear problem. There might be advantages to doing that. So that's the general framework we're working in. Another important thing about X-ray imaging, particularly, uh, particularly CT, is that noise is, is really interesting. It's unlike MRI in that the noise is can be highly non-stationary. And this is illustrated off uh, our test bench that I have really right behind me in the lab, where we've just taken a head phantom with a skull in the middle of it. And I've taken two images. And what you see is one of those images on the left. And on the right, I've subtracted the two images. So the mean is basically gone. But what you see is the residual, which is just the noise. And what you can see is there is a pretty dramatic difference in the relative noise content in the center of the object, where there's a lot of attenuation and relatively less noise out the edge. And in fact, in CT, you can see this level of noise changed by an order or magnitude of or two. So this is where model-based iterative techniques have really had an advantage in CT because we can actually assign each measurement a data fidelity where we know that some measurements have much more information content than others, and then we can balance this out. Oops. And there we go. So the other way we could potentially handle this very non-stationary noise is maybe we could change something in hardware uh, to, uh, to perhaps make the noise more uniform. This is done in current CT systems and it's been done for some time with uh, what they call bow tie filters. And basically the idea is let's assume that, let's just assume for the moment our patients are perfectly symmetric and uniform, uh, what I could do is I could pre-attenuate the beam, essentially put more attenuating material out of the edge so that by the time it goes through both this filter and the patient, I get something more uniform. Um, now, what exactly these bow ties look like depend on the material you're making them out of, but you, you should be able to do this. The main problem is patients aren't uniform and they aren't symmetric. In fact, uh, even, you know, within one slice of a patient, patients tend to be, they tend to be wider than they are deep. So uh, as you rotate around the patient, that's not going to work. Um, or as you scan along the length of the patient, you know, people's heads are smaller than their, their bodies. So there's can be a pretty dramatic uh, chain. Um, so this has gotten a lot of folks thinking, including uh, us at Johns Hopkins, is there a way to build one of these that would be dynamic, that we can adaptively change to the shape of the patient? There are a lot of different strategies out here uh, that different labs have taken a look at. We've, we've 
taken a somewhat maybe exotic approach to this where rather than attenuating the x-rays by a different thickness of material, we'd like to use a, a binary filter. We're, we're calling these binary filters multiple aperture devices. And the basic concept is if you make the, these little apertures, these little slits larger, you're letting through more x-rays locally and less where those slots are thinner. And then these are done at very fine scale, so you don't really see the patterns. Now you might look at that and say, well, there's nothing dynamic about that. And that's true. But if you put two of them in series, you can now with very, very small motions have a, a pretty dramatic impact on the local fluence patterns. And if you think about this, what we're actually doing is we're actually designing moiré patterns uh, as these two high frequency structures overlap. Um, and we can build these things out of, out of uh, 3D printed tungsten so that they're, they're basically binary. Let's see, I did get a question here. Uh, isn't purposely attenuating the signal to make the noise more uniform fundamentally a wasteful strategy? Well, I, this, this is true. So uh, one of the things we had to worry about is we need to produce all these x-rays. X-ray production is a notoriously inefficient process. Most of when you're accelerating electrons into a tungsten target, uh, most of that goes into heat. And you look at x-ray tube design, it's a lot about heat management. Um, and then there are all these strategies for making the focal spot small. So it is wasteful, but there's, um, one of the driving factors in X-ray CT is there's been huge concern, particularly publicly, about radiation dose. So if you can develop strategies for more effective use of the photons that you're creating, then uh, that, that can be a good thing. In fact, we can start talking about photon budgets where you get 100,000 photons to make the best image that you possibly can. Then we start asking questions like, where do we put those photons? And that's what I'd like to get into. So you're you're right. You uh, you, you do have to be careful because you're uh, you're inherently throwing away uh, a lot of your photons here. The other thing you might suggest is looking at these binary patterns that maybe you don't really want a binary pattern. What you really like is something more continuous. Well, the the good news and the bad news, depending on how you think about it, is these these X-ray focal spots are actually extended. So particularly for objects placed very near the focal spot, there's actually a fair amount of blur there and there is a low pass effect. And we end up do getting relatively continuous uh, distributions of X-ray films. Uh, let's see. And uh, so we, we have done this and implemented it both in a test bench system. This is a kind of highly controlled environment where we can move things very precisely. What you're seeing in the movie on the bottom is a, we're going from a very narrow beam to a very wide beam so that we can control essentially what the, the shape and profile of that beam looks like. We've also done this on a diagnostic CT gantry uh, what's nice about these is they're they're very compact. We can actually there's room to fit them in that gantry. They're relatively lightweight. Remember, we're if we're spinning three to five hertz, uh, where all these materials are pulling about 13 g's, so everything weighs just way more than you would expect. So just moving things around, even if they only weigh you know a couple hundred grams, actually becomes a big challenge. Uh, and I think. Uh, and using linear motors, we can actually keep up with these kinds of fast rotating systems. So we have all these tools now, and uh, we can start thinking about that question about, you know, if you have a certain photon budget and you say, where, where are we going to put the photons? Well, we now have control uh, over that. Uh, we can change the width. You can actually move both uh, these filters side to side and control kind of the center of the beam. So for perhaps for an elliptical object, you could modulate the width of this beam and have a towards some objective. You might want to make it a uniform like we talked about before. But but maybe maybe you don't. Uh, I think there's this is potentially a big open question. If you if you have a photon budget, where should you really put the photons? And I think it's worth thinking about that. And this this is actually going to raise a bunch of different questions. 
Before I jump right into the deep end of the pool and talk about fluence field modulation, I'd like to go to a simpler problem. If, we, if we're only considering one point in this object, we don't necessarily have to do fluence field modulation. You could just do something where you change the, the tube current, that is just changing the overall level of x-rays. If you can solve the tube current modulation problem, I think it'll lead, uh, give, give you more intuition on solving a more general problem of fluence field. So here's, here's the basic idea that we want to go after is that we have some patient volume and let, let's say we kind of know where we want to look and we want to optimize the imaging system to get good imaging performance in, the, in that location. And, and then let's pick the simple case of rather than optimizing the whole fluence field, I'm only going to alter as we rotate around the patient, what is the tube current? So in this case, in, and CT systems do this right now, classically, they tend to shoot more x-rays through in the lateral views. Those are where there's more attenuation and less x-rays in this view. So this is a particular fluence field pattern shown in this polar plot. Let's say I want to I want to figure out a way to optimize that as sort of according to some criteria. But maybe there are other things. I mean, I think we have a lot of algorithm folks on the talk here. I want to I don't want to just optimize the data acquisition. I want to optimize something about the reconstruction as well. And I'm going to pick a, a you know, a increasingly outdated uh, uh, reconstruction, one of these model-based uh, iterative methods, uh, penalized like the approach where I'm going to use a simple roughness penalty, but let's say I don't know what that roughness penalty looks like uh, exactly. I'm going to allow this to have differential uh, smoothing in different directions. So let's say I now want to optimize my system to find the best possible best possible tube current modulation, but also the best possible regularization. Um, and uh, so this this brings up a big question. I, I need to I need to define what I mean by best possible thing. So we're we're talking fundamentally about things about image quality and imaging performance. So so if we were in a big group, I would ask everyone to raise their hands. Maybe I can even do that. But uh, I, I, I like to ask folks, you know, if I show you these two, these two images on the screen, uh, which one's better? And invariably, you know, people pick one or the other. But I'm going to argue that it's, it's actually really, really difficult to tell which one's better. Um, because I, I don't know what you're going to use the image for. So let's, let's dig into that a little bit more deeply. And what I'm showing you here is, so the, uh, on the previous slide, uh, Dr. Finup was asking if, uh, what I meant by roughness penalty, if I'm talking about a total variation penalty or, or something better. No, in fact, maybe I'm talking about something worse. I'm talking about a simple quadratic uh, uh, roughness penalty. So pairwise quadratic on uh, nearest uh, neighbors. Um, I'll, I'll show you why I'm looking at that particular penalty later, but uh, I think there, I think this this is a really important part of the discussion. Uh, what happens when we look at increasingly kind of nonlinear uh, image formation methods? But to uh, to finish the thoughts on this slide, um, what I'm showing here is a series of images. Every one of these images has the same noise variance in it. Um, to the left of this vertical line, I'm showing two signals that we might be looking for in our data. One is a high frequency signal, almost uh, impulse-like, and the other is a broader, more distributed, maybe a Gaussian kind of bump that I'm looking for. And what you can see is, even though every one of these images has the same noise variance in it, the ability to discern that signal we're looking for really varies. In fact, if I'm looking for the high frequency signal, I might say, oh, this imaging system on the right is preferred. Or if I'm looking for the lower frequency signal, maybe the one on the left. And there's a real problem when the noise takes on a similar texture as the signal we're looking for. So what I'm trying to uh, communicate is that, you know, I, we have to be careful. We can't use necessarily something as simple as noise variance as our image metric because it, it really depends how we're using our signal. I think the same is true for other very popular metrics like root mean squared error or PSNR, but 
let's let's uh, let's keep it simple. I'm uh, I'm just talking uh, going to talk about a you know I'll illustrate this with a noise variance because it's easy to show. So how do I take this to the next level? Well, there's actually been a ton of work on uh, modeling observers and trying to numerically compute how they're going to perform. Um, I'm not going to give you a, a total review of this, but briefly I'll talk about um, things like detectability index. And what that is, it's basically taking a, a, an observer model. Um, in this case, a I'm, I'm picking what's called a non-pre-whitening observer model. That means whatever the observer is, as when it looks at data, it can't it can't decorrelate uh, the uh, the signals that are that are coming in. But you know those correlations are make things more difficult potentially for to do the discrimination task or detection task. So we can write down expressions for this detectability index. Uh, and what it's composed of is are familiar things. There are, in this case, there is a frequency domain measure of the spatial resolution, the MTF. Um, there are the frequency domain measure of the noise power of the noise and the noise power spectrum. So you can see that there's a kind of uh, signal to noise ratio in here, but it's also weighted by the frequency content of the task function. So I need to know what it is you're looking for, and that task function could be you know signal present, signal absent. It could be uh, a discrimination between two different hypotheses. But what this is telling you are what frequencies are important in order for me to accomplish my task. Now, there's some other things in here. Um, uh, I'm saying that my MTF, this is my MTF of the produced image, the reconstructed image, is, is a function of a number of things. J, which is really, I'm mean, talking about a location, but also these two omegas, omega A and omega R. That is every possible acquisition parameter and every possible reconstruction parameter I might have can affect the modulation transfer function. Of course, it can affect the noise as well, but then it affects the overall detectability. And what this detectability is really measuring, it's really measuring this kind of separation uh, of these two hypotheses. If you have a very good detectability index, these, these hypotheses are well separated and you're gonna be able to uh, do your task well. If they're highly overlapping and close, you're not. So we'd like to apply this in that same kind of framework I showed you before to do kind of system design. So again, I'm gonna adopt that uh, penalized likelihood uh, estimation approach since it's, it's quite general. Uh, uh, I can model whatever those fluence field patterns are or we'll start with the two current modulation uh, which may be a function of just theta, or maybe a function of theta and the radius. Um, but in order to do this, I need to know what the noise and resolution are in the reconstructed image. Um, so uh, those those of you uh, who have uh, kind of read what I did back in grad school, that's that's why I spent several years doing uh, writing down closed forms approximations of reconstructed noise and resolution. Um, and you can do that for these more simple regularization strategies. So when Dr. Finop asked if I was doing total variation, no, not so much, but it really has to do with, it becomes much harder to predict what the noise and resolution properties are for those kinds of regularizers. Um, I think we've made some uh, progress uh, toward more complicated ones, but I wanted to start in the simplest case right here. And if you look at these expressions, they're dependent on all the things we just talked about. They're dependent on location, uh, they're dependent on the regularizer, uh, and they're dependent on the data. In this case, they're depending on the data through the projections themselves. And that's nice in CT. That means you don't actually have to know the object, you only need to know the projections of the object, which sometimes you can get uh, directly via measurement. If you look at these quantities, you'll see something very typical in CT and very typical with model-based reconstruction is that the noise and resolution properties are both non-stationary or shift variant. Depending where you look, uh, the, the properties change dramatically. So let's put this into an optimization framework. So in order to do this, I need to have some idea of what my patient anatomy looks like. I need to know things like 
where am I looking in, in the uh, in the uh, object? But I also need to know about my imaging task. Uh, where is it? Uh, what is the contrast? What spatial frequencies are important? This lets me compute that objective function that I can then plug in to kind of an end-to-end -end model with whatever acquisition and reconstruction parameters I'm interested in and do the optimization and try to figure out, oh, here, what is, what is that modulation pattern I would like? What is the regularization strategy I should be doing? And we've done this for uh, this simple case of tube current modulation. We, we look specifically, I think we are, this is the case where we're looking specifically at that discrimination task I showed before, where you have three kind of high frequency uh, stimuli versus one larger frequency, or lo larger low frequency stimuli. So you might imagine if it gets too blurry, those three little uh, foci blur together. And then let's, let's compare what happens in different methods. So, Kind of the, the most basic approach is you don't do any tube current modulation in the object. You shoot the same amount of x-rays as you go all the way around. And what I'm showing here in these images is actually the exponent to your regularization because you have a log likelihood. It's actually the exponent that matters. So this is, think of this as 10 to the zero uh, in all directions. So it's unity scaling in all directions. Now you might do what I suggested. You might say, I'm going to aim for a uniform signal at the detector. That would be one of the classic things where you shoot more x-rays through laterally and less through vertically, and I'm not going to muck with the regularizer. Or you might, uh, you might go back to uh, what folks have actually worked out with filter back projection reconstruction, where you say explicitly, I want the reconstruction that provides the minimum variance in the reconstruction. Now, I already I already warned you that I don't like variance as an objective, but you can actually work out that solution. You find uh, that you should modulate the x-rays kind of with the, the square root of that attenuation path length to the object. So that's that was what would give you the minimum variance solution. Let's see. I saw, uh, are the three-dimensional integrals in the previous slides can actually be reduced to multiple independent 2D integrals due to the TX, RX pairs being independent? Uh, yes, in, in that case, I mean, if they are independent, you, you, you could uh, do those individually. I think, uh, let's, uh, where was I? I know you must be talking here. So it really depends on the, I guess, the separability of your uh, NTF and noise powers, in which, in this case, uh, they, they, they may not be separable. Let's see, is that right? I, let, let, me, let me think about that. Um, in any case, let, 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 me, let me forge ahead. Uh, so th these are on the left-hand side of the green line. These are kind of the classic uh, approaches. And on the right-hand side are the outputs when we do an optimization. So I'm showing three different versions of that. One is you only do two current modulation, in which case you find the opposite pattern says, so, well, maybe we should be shooting more x-rays through in that, in that shallow direction, which is interesting. Um, maybe I only optimize the regularization, in which case it says, no, you should have differential uh, regularization. Maybe there should be more smoothing uh, in this vertical direction, less smoothing in this direction. Or, or maybe let's design both. And you can see when we do that, we, we get a compounding effect. It says, oh yeah, I do. Do, do maybe a bit more smoothing in that direction, do uh, more fluence in that direction. So, so that's interesting, that's counterintuitive. It's exactly the opposite of what's happening in CT scanners right now in the uh, clinic. Um, when we look at uh, reconstructions, again, we, we have a task here where this is a case where every one of these reconstructions has these three stimuli in it, but the goal is to be able to differentiate between those three stimuli and sort of a, a Gaussian blob of uh, equal size. And you can see uh, I have a baseline here where we didn't do any modulation, not, no changing around the regularization. The relative detectability that I can be here, we'll just define that as one. If you go to the case where you shoot more x-rays through laterally and don't change the regularization, uh, I think you can see both in our computed metric and the reconstruction, we, we actually have lost detectability. It's actually harder to see those. 
Um, that's also true if you use this minimum variance solution. Um, so that's the minimum variance solution if you were to apply filter factors, which of course we're not. We, all of this, all of these are penalized like the reconstructions. But that acquisition strategy still leads to a drop in detectability. Now, if you start playing with the tube current modulation in a task-driven way, you might look at this and say, ah, yeah, I, maybe it's better. It's hard to say. It's not a, it's not a, a huge difference in detectability. Um, maybe I only change their regularization. That doesn't seem to do a whole lot. Maybe it's comparable. But when I do both, I might argue, oh, OK, now we're getting somewhere. I, I seem to be able to do more um, in the case where I'm shooting the exact same phone number of photons through, but I'm changing how I allocate those uh, in angle. So this is this is the simple the simple problem of two D or uh, tube current modulation. Um, let's go to the more complicated problem now. If you think about what fluence field modulation, where you can change the the shape of the beam everywhere, essentially it lets you do tube current modulation at every point in the image. So because you use essentially solve the the single point problem just with tube current. So what if I want to deal with the whole image? Well, now I need to think about, let's say my task is the same everywhere in the image, and I have the potential for these, uh, these stimuli anywhere. How am I going to design now? Well, we've taken the tack that we have a new objective function here that I still want to maximize detectability, but I actually want to maximize the minimum detectability over the um, ensemble of all these positions. And in fact, what that'll do is you bring up the detectability everywhere. Um, so we've done this kind of optimization, the same, uh, same kind of task function where we're trying to do this discrimination. Uh, we can compare uh, with the flattened fluence. So if you look at the sinogram as you rotate around here, we're saying, yeah, when we are in that lateral view, we should shoot more x-rays through. Um, there is an analogous uh, FBP solution here, where you can find the minimum mean variance solution. Again, that kind of goes with the square root of the uh, radiological path length. Or we can do our task-driven approach. When we do the task-driven approach, again, we see this inversion that says we should shoot more x-rays through. It's interesting, within a view, we should still kind of try to homogenize, but we should uh, shoot more x-rays through in this short direction. Um, and we can also look at uh, the, the, the local regularization. What you find is it still finds that there should be a preferential smoothing direction. And there's also some shift variance there, depending where you, need, you are on the image, you might want to smooth more or less. Um, and we find similar answers here. So uh, rather than showing you all the different locations, uh, I'm showing you a, a sampling of positions. Again, you can see as you go from the unmodulated case to, sorry, this is kind of a, uh, a numerical encoding we use. This is the, the uniform or flat field at the detector solution. This alpha equals 0.5 cases, that square root. It's, it's kind of an exponent of the path length uh, in terms of correction. Uh, you can see both those. These are now absolute detectabilities, but uh, you, again, you can see that um, whereas there is, you can see the potential advantage of going from the unmodulated case to the task-driven case. Now, in some cases, it looks like it is actually being decreased, but that's because the detectability maps are very non-uniform. You can see in the unmodulated case, the detectability is quite high out at the edge, and that's because you're getting a lot of fluence uh, going throughout. The, your signal is very good, but if you were, if your metric is really the the minimum detectability over the entire field that occurs in the middle and we're beating it. So what you really want is to kind of have a uniformly high detectability. Uh, you do get a uniform detectability with this home, uh, flat, field flattening case, but it is uniformly higher than you would get in the detectability case. So um, <clears throat> you can uh, then equate these to different uh, levels of dose reduction depending where you are. Uh, but uh, We've been uh, very happy with this, and we've uh, implemented on that uh, physical system that you uh, showed you previously. So that's one category of a uh, new thing that's happening in CT. 
all right, just, uh, uh, is variable speed rotation of the CP rail possible? So, well, this is a great, uh, great kind of uh, intro to the, to the next section. Those, uh, those standard diagnostic CP gantries, they are highly tuned to do those very, very fast rotations that are done at a continuous rotation speed. There is more opportunity for um, data kind of uh, interesting motion profile in, in interventional imaging. And what, what I'm showing here is an interventional system uh, that uh, colleagues at the University of Sydney have, uh, that we've been working with them on. And uh, what, what this system allows us to do, because it's essentially the source and detector are connected to this robot arm. We're not constrained by doing ordinary circles or, or spirals if the table's uh, moving. We can define any orbit you want, potentially. So this isn't um, <clears throat> this isn't the kind of speed uh, adjustment that uh, that one uh, that Unal has uh, suggested, but. Uh, you could potentially do that. Uh, that's not something we, we've investigated here. Um, so I have a question uh, from uh, Theodore that says, how do you compare images and how do you know uh, if one image is better than the other other than visual cues? cues? And uh, I, I, that, is the, that is the core of uh, what we've been talking about here. I think in order to tell which uh, image is better, we really want to we, we want to have something quantitative. We do not want it to be you know this kind of A versus B comparison. I, I jokingly say this that you know when you read any paper, right? You look at the two images and you, you already know which one is the better image. The better image always goes on the on the on the right, and that's whatever algorithm people uh, have proposed. But what we had to we and, and and maybe there's you know quantitative information back to that. But I, I, what we really should get away from is these pure kind of beauty contest where we're just looking and saying, you know, qualitatively, oh, this one looks better. I think because the kind of pictures I showed you before, it's really important to identify what are you going to use this image for? If you're going to use it for these kind of discrimination tasks uh, I've shown you, then um, can we come up with a mathematical model that is, is really saying something about the way the human visual system and the human brain works um, to to be able to predict what that performance is. And we've picked this uh, non pre whitening observer model that's been shown in some studies to be a good indicator of how humans work. Um, or, or maybe we need to go down another path and say, well, maybe, maybe humans aren't in the loop and uh, we're gonna have some machine learning type discriminator doing this. Well, let's, let's base it on the performance of that. That's, that's gonna tell you whether the images are it, whether the imaging system is highly performing or not. I think the, now you can't always do this in every case, right? You don't always know what the images are gonna be used for. And in that case, maybe you do have to fall back onto more general measures of image imaging performance like RMSE. But uh, we, we kind of know that RMSE is not, not a good measure when it comes to human visual systems. I think there's probably reason to believe that's that's also true for, machine learning systems that are maybe trying to do the same path. Uh, you know, if there are certain frequencies that are important, maybe those are the ones we should really make sure it come through. Um, so getting back to this other potential flexibility in data acquisition, there's this idea of orbit. Let's, let's break away from helical scans, which have been done for decades and use it in one of these interventional systems that uh, that's not really how they're being used right now. Really, that's just to kind of put your fluoro system in the right position, but these systems are ready to do this right now if you give them the right commands. So let's do this within a, a very particular framework. Again, in order to define things like task-based performance, I, I, I have a task. So the nice thing about interventional imaging is that no, no one gets interventional imaging until they've had diagnostic. So some of the things that we need in a workflow, like what do we think the patient looks like, because that's going to be important in driving 
uh, the, the acquisition and reconstruction risk. We have that. And in fact, part of the process, this is emulating kind of a workflow for the coiling of a intracranial aneurysm. So if you don't know what happens, if you have an intracranial aneurysm, those are at risk from, for bursting. And one solution is to have a endovascular intervention where a radiologist fills that aneurysm with a, it's a very flexible coil made of like a platinum iridium alloy. If you pack that tightly enough with that coil, essentially blood flow in there stops, it clots off, and then uh, these are very highly successful procedures, uh, presuming you don't perforate the aneurysm. If you perforate the aneurysm, then it's, uh, it's a bad day for everyone. So in this case, you're gonna have this kind of preoperative imaging available. In fact, there's even planning data where they're saying, well, here's where the aneurysm is. Here's an estimation of where that coil has to go, how much coil needs to go in there. So we, we know a bunch of things about this problem. We also know where, where are we gonna be looking for things in the image? And this is, this is actually a head phantom that I'll, I'll describe in a little bit more in a second, where immediately around that embolization coil, we're, we'd be looking for bleeds. Uh, that would be an indication of a perforation. So what I'd like to do is to build that same kind of framework we had before and say, well, give me the orbit. What is the orbit? that is going to give me the best detectability of bleeds surrounding that embolization coil. Now, this is really challenging because platinum iridium alloys are really highly <laughs> attenuating and just overall bad for CT. Any x-rays passing through that are gonna be very highly attenuated. And you have this real problem that your image quality in these images tends to be worse exactly where it needs to be good because that's where I'm looking. And the, the open question is, if I do this kind of patient-specific and task-driven imaging, can I do better? Well, I'll, I won't go through the math again, but we, we've done this. And uh, what I'm showing is kind of the standard circular orbit in cyan. You can see that embolization coil in blue. Uh, and the, the magenta orbit here, uh, well, what I've said is, I wanna, I'm going to pick some point directly behind that embolization coil, and I want to be able to detect bleeds there. And what we find is, well, it, the algorithm has said, well, try not to have path lengths of x-ray overlapping in your region of interest and that embolization coil. That's going to be, excuse me, really bad for your signal. So wobble around. But it also says, you'd be better off tilting the whole orbit. And this is interesting because this is actually something that was learned uh, decades ago. If you want to make really good brain images, they tend to tilt the gantry or tilt the patient's head to get the, the skull base out of the field of view because there's all this highly attenuating bony material here. So this is encouraging when we first saw this since that's something that fell out of the algorithm that was not a constraint from the design. Uh, now, of course, uh, we wanted to test this out in a real, uh, real systems. Great. Uh, sorry, just keeping track of the chats. The, uh, this is a head phantom that we've uh, used in the lab. It's, uh, it has a human skull surrounded by tissue equivalent plastic, but it's hollow, so we can put anything we want in there. And what we've done is put a synthetic vasculature in there, filled the rest of the cavity with jello. Jello is good as uh, emulation of brain tissue. And we've actually gone through that entire process that I showed before. So this is one fluoro shot kind of mid intervention where the uh, we have a interventional radiologist filling that uh, with this embolization coil. The other thing we've done is I've glued little acrylic spheres on the outside of that uh, aneurysm to emulate uh, bleeds uh, since that's uh, approximately the right contrast. And then this is before we had access to that fancy system I showed you in Australia. Uh, we have a test bench here where these test benches, we tend to do the opposite thing. We rotate the patient instead of the, the x-ray tube and uh, detector since in this case, because our patient's only a head, it's a lot lighter. And you can see because we have this hexapod in the middle, I can do non-circular orbits. If we go through that process and we uh, look at the reconstructions, we can see what things look should look like because this is the preoperative scan. 
We can see our location of interest that we'd like to be able to see this bleed. And then you can compare both the standard circular trajectory and the task driven trajectory. And you can see the change. We have this uh, embolization coil in there. Uh, you can see things like the legs of a stent that are in the artery, trying to keep that embolization coil up inside the aneurysm. Uh, if you, you can also see some residual contrast agent. When these are done, they're done with iodine and contrast. We didn't quite flush all of that out. Uh, and we can zoom in and see the same effect. Now, what's interesting here is the algorithm has done exactly what we said. We said, we'd like the image quality to be good here. I'd like to be able to detect bleeds here. But it's done exactly that and made the image quality good here, perhaps at the cost of making the image quality worse elsewhere, because there, there was no constraint. So if you really want to do this, we should go kind of to an objective function like I showed you before. Rather than optimizing in a single point, let's pick a whole set of points. Now, these are points that we think this is where they're going to be bleeds. I'd like to, again, maximize the minimum detectability over all those points. So make them all try to boost all those levels up as much as possible. Uh, a little bit about the parameterization of the object uh, and the uh, the, the orbit here, but I won't go into those details. Here are the outputs of both the, the, the standard circular design and the, the task-based design. And what you can see is there are some familiar things in here. There's a slight tilt to the orbit. There's an interesting kind of low frequency wobble as we go around. Uh, you can see the projection data is a little bit different. If you look closely, there's some interesting features to that data as you come around. Uh, the algorithm wants to shoot kind of up directly through the uh, nasal sinuses. Those are low attenuating, so maybe you know, it's trying to get some good signal over there. We've also constrained kind of the maximal tilt. If you looked at that uh, system, there's actually a, a maximum tilt angle we can do. Um, when we do that, we get reconstructions that look like this, that uh, you can see that um, whereas these six kind of beads that have been placed around the embolization coil are maybe difficult to see. When you go to the task-driven orbit, we're really kind of pushing all those image quality problems in as tightly as possible to that embolization coil. And I think we get much better discrimination. Let's see, just checking. Okay, great. Um, and that, that brings me to kind of one last uh, kind of innovation that is actively being worked on in CT, and that's the idea of using, using spectral information. So standard CT, you're, you're shooting x-rays at using a single KV on the x-ray tube. That gives you a spectrum, but it's a single spectrum that's the same as you rotate around. There are a number of different investigations uh, ongoing right now where you try to encode spectral information into your CT system by by changing the KV dynamically, maybe switching back and forth real quickly, maybe using a detector that actually can discriminate energy. There are new photon counting detectors that um, let you say, oh, I received this many photons in this energy bin, this many in this energy bin. And what the, that lets us do, rather than producing these kind of images that are just talking about the bulk attenuation properties of X-rays as they pass through, we can now start doing material discrimination, or, or more importantly, material decomposition, where we're actually getting concentrations of different materials. So I'm showing work of a, a postdoc of mine that has used photon counting detectors to do a multi-material decomposition and tell you concentrations of three different contrast agents. You can really only see two here, except for a calibration standard of uh, iodine and gadolinium. And those have been time delayed in injection so you can see their distributions are different. So, and not only do we get the distributions, but we actually get the concentrations. So there are any number of ways to do this kind of spectral CT. But again, I would argue that we should think about how, how we're using this and uh, come up with uh, nice algorithms and uh, nice ways of assessing. Um, one of the things that people have talked about a lot is using this to find concentrations of specific contrast agents like I showed you before. So things like iodine and gadolinium are FDA approved contrast agents that can be used right now. 
things like gold nanoparticles are not approved, but they uh, are being investigated extensively in uh, animal imaging. Nice thing about these compounds is they have very distinctive attenuation profiles when you uh, look at their attenuation as a function of photon energy. Whereas uh, water has this largely smooth profile, there are these distinct jumps uh, in attenuation for the, these kinds of materials. And that has to do with uh, the outer shell electrons uh, and interactions with X-rays. But uh, these jumps are really good in being able to differentiate these different materials. So just like you, we looked at a penalized likelihood strategy for reconstructing attenuation, you can look at the same thing where you recast the problem, where we take these energy dependent attenuations into account in these terms Q, we still have to obey Beer's law for any given um, uh, photon energy, but then we can kind of integrate up based on what the, the, the sh system is uh, shooting. So you have a slightly different forward model here, but really it's just the addition of another linear operator up here. Now I saw there was a raised hand uh, question. Sai, can, can we give uh, permission to that person to ask a question? Yes. Um, I, 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 is it, I saw Ben, someone, I think. But it yeah, went away. I, I enabled, I think it was Benjamin Weber and I enabled uh, Benjamin to speak. And I see another raised hand from uh, Gu. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, or... sorry, there was a mistake, my bad. Yeah. Oh, you mistakenly raised your hand? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, okay. Well, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll uh, forge ahead, but I'll, uh, I'm happy to take questions at any time. Um, again, I, I don't want to go into the details of this kind of reconstruction. Uh, there are modifications based on uh, kind of popular techniques to solve this kind of objective within this kind of penalized likelihood framework. Uh, the nice thing about this framework is we can also apply this the same kind of uh, theory that I've been showing you before. Um, but because uh, you know uh, we are not just a, an algorithm uh, team uh, over at Hopkins, we, we we actually like being involved with the hardware. I'm also going to introduce uh, uh, another maybe slightly off the wall design for doing spectral CT, and this is kind of summarized here um, in what we're calling spatial spectral filters, and the, the basic idea is let's say you have an ordinary X-ray uh, shooting at a single KV. So there's some spectrum of X-rays coming out of it. Uh, but let's use the same kind of materials that have these distinct attenuation uh, jumps in them. Those are called K edges. Let's use that to uh, pre-filter our beam. So we know that that will give us a diversity of different spectra basically break our beam up into a bunch of different beamlets. So you, can, you, can, uh, this, you can think about this being analogous to color imaging, where I have a, a set of different spectral basis functions. I can have as many as I want all tiled up. Uh, if you look at what happens to the x-ray beam after it passes through, you can see that uh, they've been spectrally shaped. Really, you know, there's this huge decrease after you uh, hit that k edge. So in this case, I'm really trading off spatial information and spectral information. This has been done in other optical imaging problems, uh, but I, I thought, well, why not let's uh, apply this to CT? If you uh, do that, we wanna do one more thing. We actually wanna, I wanna be able to translate this uh, tiled filter. If you think about it, if I don't move it, the very center of my object is always gonna see the exact same filtration. So I wanna make sure that it kind of moves around that I get good sampling. So if I think about what's happening in this multi-material phantom that is just composed of a bunch of different, uh, you know, these three, three contrast agents and different mixtures, if I look at that sinogram, what my beamlets look like in this sinogram domain are, are kind of these tiled uh, diagonal patterns. So what's interesting here is I have, I have projection data 
that is it's fully sampled spatially, but in each spectrum, it is sparse. So this this uh, has got me thinking. I mean, there's all kinds of work on sparse data acquisitions, uh, but maybe this is slightly weak, more weakly sparse because uh, it's it's fully sampled spatially, but it's the the spectral part that is uh, mixed. And as we rotate all the way around the object, we're going to see uh, a combination of the spectral data. Um, so initially, we we tried this out and, and uh, just to see if it would work in simulation. We we worked uh, on very really hard on a sophisticated end-to-end -end forward model to take into account real physical effects like the the focal spot is extended, so these beamlets are they're a little bit blurry at the edges, or even if they weren't, because the way you make tiles, there's kind of you know fractional things happening at the edges. If you put all that in the model, we still find that you can get you know nice multi-material decomposition and reconstructions here, and uh, and we were able to, with uh, fairly good confidence, get uh, estimates of the concentrations here. So we've done that, but just like we saw in these other cases, um, how do we how do we really optimize the system? I mean, there are all kinds of potential things we could do in designing. This filter, what what filter materials do we want to use? What is the the size of the materials? Maybe how fast are you moving it around? So, and I want to do that in a way that's more sophisticated than just saying, you know, well, try out a whole bunch or try to minimize uh, RMS error. Let's uh, let's look at something that uh, uh, one of my uh, PhD students has uh, been working on, which is really to to generalize uh, this idea of detectability for spectral imaging. And, and this is the expression that we've come up with, uh, something that he's calling separability index. And it's based on the detectability. But let me, let me dig a little bit more deeply into this. So we, first, I want you to think about what are, what are spectral CT systems potentially good at that maybe single energy CT systems wouldn't be good at. Well, one thing I can imagine is, let's say you're looking for a lesion in a liver, and maybe that, like you, you kind of see in this bottom image, maybe that lesion is hypodense. It's, uh, you know, it has a lower density of water-like material there. But when I inject a contrast agent, let's say it enhances, it is possible for that to enhance to just the right level that in a singular energy image, it's going to be totally flat. You would never see it. A spectral CT system would have an advantage here because it can do the decomposition, separate out the water component, separate out the iodine component, and then be able to see it. And that's really what we're talking about in this expression for separability, that if you have a stimulus in, so these K1 and K2 are the two different basis materials, so let's say it's iodine and water, I want to kind of maximize the ability to separate the difference of those normalized by kind of the sum of those. And the, this is the kind of optimization we do here. Now you, I won't go into the expressions for detectability, but they, they look familiar like the other expressions we had. Um, and we can, we can do this kind of design. And we've done this design over, I, I forget all the different materials uh, we looked at, but over an ensemble of different uh, metals things like gold and erbium and gadolinium uh, as filters, but also over what is the, the width of those filters. And I think in this case, we just, we just moved at a, uh, a constant rate and then did that optimization. What you're seeing here are kind of violin plots of what is the, the performance uh, in terms of uh, separability index for for random designs, if I just pick random designs in that uh, ensemble of all possible filter types and filter widths, um, you you get a distribution that is, uh, you know, there's there's kind of a, a mode here. Maybe there's a mean performance here if you were just to pick a random design. This red design is the case if you do the optimization, but you you fix those filter widths to be equal. Uh, versus what happens if you, you you open up things and do the whole optimization. 
uh, those best case scenarios are up here where you have the highest separability index. And I'm showing those two cases for a, a large phantom that's 32 centimeters, so something in like the body versus a smaller one that's only 16 centimeters, something more like the head. And what you'll find is, well, they're, they're dis different designs that are optimal. So there, there's still this object dependence there. Um, but we can also look at uh, how they perform. And I, here I'm actually comparing that case. Uh, what if you use the, the equally spaced design versus the, the design with unequal spacing? You can see there's much more ability to differentiate and identify this uh, kind of lesion that I talked about. Um, those were simulations, not being happy with simulations. Uh, we've done some physical experiments. Unfortunately, in physical experiments, we've only done the equal spa equally spaced design. Um, so here's a uh, image of what that uh, filter looks like. It has tin and erbium and tungsten and lead, kind of in a repeating pattern. We move that back and forth. Here's the raw spectral data. And here is a reconstruction of various mixtures of adaline iodine and gadolinium. And you can see if you look um, at the decomposition, which is a water iodine gadolinium decomposition, these are relatively close to uh, what we actually mixed in the lab. Um, the, the concentrations of iodine and gadolinium are, are fairly low. So the water density is approximately equal to that 100 milligrams per milliliter you would expect. But uh, so these numbers are in there. Um, so, so I wanted to give you a flavor. I think uh, a, a couple of big points uh, in the talk. Uh, there, there are some really interesting things going on in CT where we're changing the way data acquisitions, acquisitions are being done. I think there is increasingly a place for advanced algorithm development. I've, I've shown you kind of, I don't know, technology that's probably a couple of decades old in terms of reconstruction. I think there's much more sophisticated things that can be done out there. And I think they should be done. However, I think we should be really careful about the way we are assessing image quality and performance of these systems because uh, we know things like noise are, are, are not telling us the full story. We know it's an interesting combination of spatial resolution and noise um, under kind of these simple scenarios. And I, what I wanted to leave you with was really a challenge that as we move to these much more interesting and much more nonlinear reconstruction methods, like what Dr. Fina uh, asked about uh, total variation methods, for example. And in fact, this picture here is effectively a kind of a comparison of a standard linear approach, which in CT would be something like filter back projection. It turns out these penalized likelihood methods with quadratic penalties are fairly locally linear. And they, the way they work is, is kind of intuitive and predictable. Uh, if I have an object that maybe I'm looking at lung imaging and I have this speculated tumor where this is really important diagnostically. If, they, if you have a, a lesion with these kind of little spikes coming out of it, that's really diagnostic in terms of uh, identifying malignancy. If I turn up regularization because I'm doing something really low exposure, I kind of know what this image represents. I know we're losing a lot of high frequencies. Maybe I should, Maybe there are still these speculations in there, maybe there aren't, uh, but I, I kind of know what's going on. If you now go to a highly nonlinear method, let's say like total variation that is edge preserving, if I presented you with this image, it looks very, very sharp. I think it's giving you a kind of a false sense of security about what might be in there and what might not be in there. Um, so I think, I think we have to be really careful uh, with these kinds of methods that uh, as we are developing quantitative measures, um, what, is, what is this image really telling us? Because we can go in here and we can say, oh, I can tell you based on an edge response, here's what the resolution is. It's not telling you the full story. So that's sort of a challenge for folks uh, out there to think about this as you're applying uh, increasingly nonlinear methods, as you're applying uh, machine learning methods, where it's not just about edge preservation, where you know textures are, uh, are going in there. Um, I think, uh, I, I think these things are super powerful and demonstrate some amazing dramatic uh, improvements, but we should also be cautious. Um, so I'm gonna end the talk there. Uh, I just wanted to quickly kind of advertise the lab. None of this work is done by me alone. 
of uh, Dr. Gong and uh, students and postdocs in the lab are instrumental in getting all this done, as are all my collaborators, both at Johns Hopkins and, and at other universities. And uh, I should thank both my uh, sources of funding as well as our industry partners. So let me stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions. And uh, if uh, uh, Dr. Gong uh, would like to help answer, that'd be great as well. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Webb. Uh, that was... So I'll stop sharing, uh, uh, but uh, if, if you, anyone wants me to go back to the slides, I can do that. Okay, Webb. Uh, is there, I, I saw a hand raised, but I, I still don't know how to. Uh, uh, yeah, I can enable, uh, yeah. Uh, I can enable uh, them to speak. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, this is Venkat. This was, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, I had a question about the part where you were discussing different trajectories when you did the, you know, when you had the C on type scanner. So could you discuss some of the challenges and the reconstructions? Because I think a lot of times people have access to standard, you know, uh, single rotation access cone beam code. And especially when you start going to the iterative methods, did you have to redesign preconditioners and uh, regularizers? Is there some some things you want to, you could give us some information about that? Yeah, so there, there are actually a, a series of challenges associated with reconstructing that data. So uh, the, particularly the, the, the kind of tools that are available um, are, are generally built for you know these kinds of circular helical trajectories, right? So they're not used to looking at uh, oblique views of the data, and, and some some projectors are actually making some assumptions uh, that helps them out with uh, computation speed, where they assume you know their voxel grids and pixel grids are aligned to each other, and that's that's simply not the case here. So we often have to use a, a slower more sophisticated uh, projector uh, to, to, to make this happen, um, uh, which is a potential concern if we're talking about interventional imaging because we, we need things to be fast. And there, here is a, you know, a potential opportunity for uh, machine learning, I, I believe, um, that maybe we can get some of the power and flexibility of a model-based approach, but do it, do it much more quickly. Um, other problems associated with uh, these kinds of uh, arbitrary trajectories is these these system geometries. They're not only are they different than the uh, helical orbits, but they they tend to be more wobbly. So even when you command the system to do a certain thing, it doesn't quite do that. It may not be as reproducible. So we we need to think about how can is there a way to kind of jointly tune that or do we need uh, something, some kind of online calibration to, to get that effect? Um, I think what you also talked about uh, some very algorithm, algorithmic uh, related uh, things like uh, preconditioning. We haven't done a whole lot of preconditioning for the, uh, the orbital problem. For the spectral imaging problem, uh, preconditioning is a huge issue that, um, the problem with when you add that additional linear operator outside the exponential, that is very bad for uh, preconditioning or very bad for conditioning the problem and your convergence rates slow way down. So intelligent preconditioning is a really big deal. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. There is a question in the Q and A uh, web if you'd like to see. Oh, there's a question about discretization or resolution uh, on uh, task-based image quality assessment. Uh, uh, Grace, uh, do you, do you want to do you want to talk about uh, discretization and sampling as it affects uh, task functions? Is that something uh, you could speak to? Um, we have. It certainly has an effect on resolution by way of the aperture, integrating aperture, uh, and sampling. But uh, we have not. That's not something we have explicitly considered in the in the optimization. Uh, not, not not for these optimizations. I, I I think you've looked at this previously for kind of 
more more standard uh, CT system design, just in terms of uh, you know if you have certain resolution targets in, in your object. I, I can certainly yeah. imagine that sometimes it. Has, we're talking, go ahead. Sometimes when we're considering uh, detector designs when they're hardware binning or software binning, so that's that's usually where the sampling uh, has been considered, at least in my work. And yeah, it's sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> and then there's a second part, like was this was the voxel size? Uh, I I think it's generally it's somewhere between 0.5 and one. So that's really dependent <clears throat> on what kind of system we're trying to emulate, and we just use that voxel size. Yeah, and that's largely driven by the system geometry and the the size of uh, the pixels on these detectors. We we tend to pick. Uh, what we call the natural voxel size, whereas if you look at the actual pixel size and then demagnify it to, you know, the, the center of the object, um, that's sort of the natural voxel size. That's what you would expect your resolution to be uh, around. Now, that, that's also not exactly true because there are other things that degrade resolution, like, you know, blur within the detector or focal spot blur, but it's it's just a good rule of thumb to, to start at that kind of a voxel, voxelization. Okay, um, I had a, I, I think I had two questions. So one is, um, I guess you're, for reconstruction, you're normally doing post-log likelihood or, or so do you, like with low dose, do you go with pre-log sometimes? Oh, uh, when we have control over it, this is all done uh, in the native measurement space. So it's all, we have not manipulated our data to, to solve the linear problem. We are solving the nonlinear problem. In fact, for the spectral CT problem, there's no option, right? I mean, if you, you're that exponential sandwich between linear operators, there, you, you can't undo that. Mm-hmm. And and it, it does lead to these the, these more complex uh, optimizers that you're kind of in, inherently always solving the, the nonlinear problem. Um, uh, so I we I haven't looked at this in great detail. I know there are folks out uh, there. I think Paul Cunahan has looked at this uh, extensively in terms of comparing kind of pre-log versus post-log uh, treatments. Uh, and where you run into real trouble is at the very low, uh, the very low doses where you're you're really up against the. Uh, well, particularly for his application, which is more pet oriented, where you're you're up against you know the the, the Poisson uh, underlying Poisson process that's truncated at zero. So if you have corrections that are pushing things negative, every everything falls apart. And um, so we we avoid that by not not doing that processing, but. Frankly, our our systems uh, are operating at high enough uh, photon levels generally that it's also not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, another question I had, which is probably like a very general question, which is, so with all the acquisition optimization and hardware development that you're doing, um, so is your it, uh, is the work that you've done, do, uh, does the hardware generally make the system overall more expensive or is that an also, is that like the cost also, does it factor in into how you do all the development of the hardware and optimization? Well, uh, that that is an excellent question. And I don't know that I have a lot of data points to kind of back up anything, but uh, I can tell you that um, there, there are definitely trade-offs here. So one of the reasons we are looking at that particular design for fluence field modulation is it has to do with the challenges of working in this CP environment where things are moving so fast. Uh, so there, there's so little space to operate within kind of this rotating volume that uh, if you wanted to do this with kind of classic uh, attenuators, you just run out of space and kind of weight, weight limits real fast. Um, all of all of these solutions are are going to have some version of added cost to it. I mean, and if you look at um, 
if you look at imaging companies and what, what they've been doing over the past, you know, really one to two decades is, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're much more quick to say, oh, well, here's, here's a software upgrade. You know, on, on some level, the software upgrade seems less expensive because you're, you're not buying, you know, a thing, except, except that's not true either. If you look at GE, when you buy the new software, you, you, get, a, you get a big, new, expensive computer to go with it. So I don't know. I, I, it's, there, it's all going to have added costs. But I mean, at some point, I think whether it goes out in the world and becomes successful is, you know, are you, are you having real impact on things? I think for things like spectral CT, where you're, you're providing fundamentally different images and you're, you're able to do quantitation where we weren't doing it before, I think that's going to have a real impact on both science and, and eventually uh, clinical research. So um, within that space, yeah, maybe maybe one of these filters that moves back and forth, that's, that's actually a lot cheaper than replacing the whole detector system with this new photon counting technology, which is still finicky. I mean, I think it's coming. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I think that it's worth looking at these different cost kind of performance trade-offs, but, uh, I can't tell you which ones are going to win. If I could, I'd probably tell you where to invest and all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, so there are still, uh, if folks in the audience, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and we can just enable you to speak. Oh, I want to thank folks again. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, speak with all of you and uh, give you some updates. Uh, I, uh, I would uh, love to uh, hear uh, what folks are thinking al algorithmically uh, beyond. Uh, I, I think uh, part of the problem of working on both uh, hardware and software is I've somewhat divided attention. So I think uh, I suspect many of you folks are way ahead of me on uh, new algorithm stuff. Yeah, and so let's thank Web again uh, and from the space webinar organizers, I would like to wish um, everyone a happy ending of the year and hope everyone stays safe uh, amidst the pandemic. And and uh, we'll be this will be the last webinar for the year and Web is our last speaker and we'll be starting back up uh, later in January. So uh, for you, uh, audience members who are interested, do watch our website and we'll be posting details of when our first webinar for next year would be and who the speaker is. And then uh, um, I hope we, uh, and also the rest of the space webinars, we have organizers, we hope that you'll be able to join back next year. And with that, uh, bye everyone. Have a good rest of your week. Take care. If anyone uh, wants to email me, I'm happy to answer more questions there. Thanks so much. Happy holidays.